just got up and said how moved they were by oh, the whole oh, film. Nice. Just one person after the other. Yeah. I, do, I don't think I was asked one actual question. They, they took over the, uh, which is which is encouraging. Oh, that's very cool. Because they were probably one of the first audiences that have actually seen it. And we're live. We are live with uh, filmmaker Michael Dillon. Michael, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Pat. We were just talking about Sunday evening. You're in Dunedin at the moment. Uh, your maybe we show a little bit of footage first of all. But when we do that first, your documentary is the best journey of the more Sir Edmund Hillary, Ocean to Sky. Um, I, it appears that uh, what it is, I've, I've watched it, but it's the journey that Sir Ed took, which we'll get into in more detail, uh, where he went up the Ganges and then tried to ascend uh, Everest. But your documentary seems to be, a, I think I timed it, about an hour and twenty of the hour and forty-five is actually the riverboat journey that seems to be quite the big exciting part part of the journey well he originally conceived this as something to do with jet boats which were invented the same year he climbed everest yeah and, and you know he took he took tractors to the south pole so he loved mechanical things so he he had the idea that well um why don't com well, let's combine the hamilton jet boat with um uh, and try and uh, after he'd climbed the highest mountain and uh, the highest mountain in the himalayas why not try and climb the or uh, climb the high the um longest river in the himalayas yeah, yeah. <laughs> add to his cv yeah amazing so um we'll get into some details about the actual there it is that's actually on the ganges that's footage from the time and the one of the more interesting things is you you've made this documentary you know today this in 2019 mm. for release from something that was well, what was it? How was seventies? It was, 70s? 77. 77. and we shot it. It was actually one the probably the only of Hillary expedition that was comprehensively filmed. And and that's the exciting thing is that you mm. were on that trip. I was, yeah, filming it. Yeah, and you've made the documentary. What that's forty years later. Well, well we did make the the conventional documentary at the time for right. television, um, fifty minutes long and with a narrator. But we didn't really tell the best parts of the story. And also, I knew that in the intervening years, the, the little, you know, the film we shot on 16mm film could be blown up so well these days and brought back to life. We used Peter Jackson's company in Wellington. Oh, nice. So that it, you see it on a big screen and it's like being there. The colour's exactly right. And, uh, and we knew that we could add that to the experience. But the other thing we wanted to add was the reminiscences of all the people on the journey mm -hmm. um, with Ed Hillary because part of the reason for making it was that it, the memory of Ed Hillary is fading a little bit. Very few people actually got the chance to, like I had the lucky chance to, to actually be with him for those three months. Mm -hmm. And we wanted the film to not just reflect the journey but but be a chance to for everybody to just to get to know Ed a bit better. Yeah, and, and it did that. There's some interesting mm. um, things that have come from it which I never knew of. For example, uh, they they actually considered him a god. <laughs> he did. was actually a god <laughs> in in that part of the world. Yes. I mean, that might be well. That might show my ignorance, but I wasn't aware of that fact. So, in India, in particular, he was mm. a god. Not he wasn't. You know, we say like there's a sporting god. He was actually <laughs> considered a god. Yeah. He, well, we, we, it took us all by surprise. After all, actually, you know, it's a very humble man back in New Zealand. But as soon as we got onto the river and, and into the more populated parts like Calcutta, people there were people everywhere. Maybe maybe three million people saw us. The whole population of New Zealand, in a sense, saw us passing through Calcutta, and we began to realise, okay, they were the, the jet boats was a novelty to them, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we also we were doing a, a pilgrimage that a lot of Hindus right. want to do, but but we realised the other element was that we we're with this Edmund Hillary, this this hero of Everest, and they have a the the the, the deities in India. There are many of them, and they all have certain roles, and and some of them can be uh, almost they have very human like features, mm -hmm. and and um, so in in some. In, in some people's minds, Ed Hillary was, in a sense, had the features of a god and was deified as a, as as one of the it, one of the incarnations of a, one of the main Hindu gods. <laughs> so it made me laugh watching the documentary um, because I've been in touch with Peter Hillary a couple of times this year, like I do with a lot of people saying, mm. "Would you be interested in coming on the podcast?" Yes. Um, to which he been quite open to completely separate from what we're talking about mm. today but to hear in the documentary him referred to as the son of god <laughs> oh, there's, there's jesus he's the son of god walking through 
Um, so, so you're in Dunedin doing one of the premieres, and how did Sunday Night go? We, it was, um, it's a, a very, very new film, and, mm. and that um, it's actually starting to be released um, in, in cinemas on this coming Thursday. But we've had these trial screenings because, well, to be honest, it, it, it's um, it's so new that it never had, a, it has not had any review. But right. we wanted to just test it out on audiences and. Uh, and we so we had a screening at, at uh, the Rialto Dunedin um, on Sunday, and it was meant to be a question and answer, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it turned into a kind of everyone just wanted to say how good a film it was oh, and how nice. it, how did move them, which is very nice to know because we're still trying to um, analyse what what the audiences will think of it, and it's it's all been very positive so far. I think the um, I mean Ed Hillary, I never met Ed. Probably mm. one of my regrets, you know, mm. working in broadcast media for yeah. twenty plus years. Mm. Sometimes you run across these people, never did. Mm. Um, but one of the in, endearing and enduring memories of him is the old, you know, I'm always in the phone book kind of thing. So the the yeah. average Kiwi bloke, yeah. um, know about his first wife and daughter dying in a car crash. Oh, sorry, plane crash. Yeah, car crash. Mm-hmm. I was always wondering. Wh- I mean, there's obviously a reason for this. Mm. I'm just not aware of it. Mm. Why? Why were they the only two on that plane? Do you know that? Yes, because Hillary, after climbing Everest, decided to dedicate his life to the Sherpas and building schools and hospitals. And and uh, Hillary was already up in the hills building. So were they coming up? They were coming up. Yeah, right. they, he was already up there uh, building the second hospital. Right. And they, he knew they were the, the quickest way to get right. there is to take a light okay, plane. That makes sense. So yeah, that that's what happened. And so that in a sense, they, the pilot, and their dog, sadly as well, um, were flying up to 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 join Ed right. up in the hills. Oh, that makes sense. I just I just wasn't aware. Why. So yeah. they were they were they were below flying up to where he that's was. Right, that's right. Yes. Okay. And yeah, the the documentary seems to be unashamedly. Um, stating that Ed um, passed the passing of his wife and daughter mm. was in a slump, yeah, and that it seems that this is almost his uh, getting out of that slump, his you know um, coming back to the Ed people used to know mm. that he went on this big adventure, and it seems to be what. Well, and there's a couple of very poignant moments, like when they mm. were doing. Uh, religious ceremonies on the water, etc. Mm. It actually says it in the documentary about mm. you know what what the team felt like Ed had just gone through, yeah. maybe spiritually or mentally or emotionally or whatever it was. Mm. So so it was fairly obvious that this was Ed kind of going, it's time to get back on with life, or I'm going to do this, and by the end of it, it became you know obvious that this is just what he needed. Yeah, I think that before Louise, his wife, died, they had talked about doing this trip together oh, right. because, after all, he, he'd been doing all his mountaineering sort of um, trips that um, you know, like Louise and couldn't go on, but they thought going up the Ganges would be a thing they could do together. And then she and his youngest uh, daughter died just two years before we did this expedition. So he was deeply grieving and uh, everyone thought this might be a chance that he could... Uh, sort of get over this just by the fact that he had to spend a lot of time planning it mm-hmm. and then the actual doing of it might might just finish the process of him getting back to the way he you know as a happy Ed that he used to be as amazing footage i thought we might show a little bit jace um that that one with all the people you're talking about all the people coming out to watch um, i can't remember the names of the rapids etc but there was a particularly difficult rapid to get through mm. and one of the um one of the people on the journey says we knew how dangerous the rapids were by how many people were turning up meaning you know they were looking for a crash <laughs> and it was it's just amazing to see that you know you think about this today you think about terms like flash mobs and things <laughs> like that and people turning up because they orchestrate through a cell phone or whatever it's like how did they know and they were all there and there was thousands <laughs> oh, no. at some places or tens of thousands or millions at other places yeah. turning up and and that looks like utter madness there's the man i know and they were fairly remote towns but they did have the radio all india radio was it was a big a big event happening edmund hillary was going up there doing this pilgrimage up the Ganges yep. so everybody knew where he was and where he was about to come to and so you know you just saw that just the whole town was there even the, even the, the nobody even bothered locking the shops because I knew the thieves were out there watching the boats right, as yeah, well yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> so um this is going to cinemas because I was wondering yes. where 
yeah. we, we had a documentary maker here in a few weeks ago mm. who did mm. a, a documentary on Rugby World Cup mm. and it wasn't going to cinemas but I was watching and thinking this should be in cinemas so this is going to be in cinemas from Thursday you got to go up against uh, Jojo Rabbit and Tiger <laughs> how do we feel about that <laughs> Well, it's uh, <laughs> different it's, audience. It's uh, I think they both got four stars. I just had a, a first review, and our, our well, our, our film's got four stars too. And it's because I think what happened was that we we had actually, to be honest, planned it to be a documentary like the normal sort of television documentary. Mm-hmm. But then one of the distributors saw it when it was half finished and realised that it was it's more it's it's not just a tale of the adventure. It's it's this human side of Hillary, mm-hmm. and and so that. He felt that there's um, a p- cinema potential uh, for it, so that's and now uh, and they it's going to be shown in fifty cinemas. So. I thought the <laughs> I, the thing we do here in the Department of Conversations we do just try to chat chinway, yeah. and I don't often bring notes with a whole bunch of you know prepped questions up, but mm. I thought of a question last night and it feels like quite a hard question to ask, but I want to ask it without giving away you know I, I don't want to do spoilers, yeah. but I think it says in the the. Uh, the promo or something that I saw about you know were they concerned they were going to lose Ed on the climb mm. and at one stage it talks about how much they're climbing versus perhaps how much they, you guys you guys not they you mm. should have been climbing and I was wondering did he have a bit of a death wish on that one I mean he'd lost his wife he'd lost his daughter As, was there an element of this where he kind of gave up all hope and he thought well if I die who cares they're gone if I go as well not a big deal he always used to travel in the in the. His best friend was uh, Jim Wilson, and he was one of the three jet boat drivers. Yep. And uh, he, <laughs> maybe out of loyalty, he always travelled with Jim, the least experienced driver, but his best friend, uh, in the in the dangerous water. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you analyse that, but when when it got to the mountain, he, I suppose he he probably he he'd been successful on so many other mountains. He thought well. Um, I, I can I can do this. I can carry as much as anybody else, and that went wrong in that, or well, partly because he he was fifty seven mm-hmm. and, and climbed Everest when he was thirty three, but he carried as much as he insisted on carrying as much as the rest of us, and can, insisted on going the pace that we went, mm-hmm. and um, it it uh, it got him. It uh, kind of got him. Yeah, yeah. So you don't think there was anything more deeper and psychological to that? You think that's just more of, he's a Kiwi bloke, I can do this. Mm. If I get your lot of you, I'll come up with you. It was a bit more of that sort of not causing trouble, keeping the schedule as opposed to something potentially a bit more Well, you, bit you, darker. you never know. No, people don't talk about this. Why he travelled in, he, he obviously, I, I know that he was he was extremely depressed. Mm. Even though it didn't seem like it, but obviously it, it, it um, and whether he he felt that he could, he could, um, his life wasn't much was worth as much as it used to be when he had a, a wife and you know a bigger family to mm. support, but but um, I think it was the fact that he just liked he just loved climbing and uh, he he went up with the rest of us, but thinking he was younger than he actually was. Right, we never yeah. fit our age, do we? Yeah, we always think we can do what we did for twenty years <laughs> yeah, ago. Yeah, that's right. Might yeah. be as simple as that. Yeah. What uh, I'd like to understand, you said that this was a. A documentary on TVNZ or mm. uh, national broadcast or whatever we called them back in the 70s. Mm. Um, how was that documentary different from this documentary? Obviously, the, this you have more time in a cinematic feature yes, yeah. to tell the story. Mm. Um, I mean, you've said the human element, but what do you mean? Explain that to me. Well, the original documentary we uh, was kind of linear thing. We knew we had a f- all TV documentaries in those days were about fifty minutes long, mm-hmm. and it's similar to tell the story of starting at the beginning and ending on the mountaintop, which we did, and it was also at the time a narr- narrator told the story. Well, this time we firstly there was a story as I told you at the end where Ed everything went wrong with Ed mm. which we didn't even include in the original documentary because really? that was kind of upward trajectory and uh, we you know it's it was too complicated a story to, to tell well within the within that 50 minute framework right. so we just started the as i said we it was a linear thing from from the ocean to the sky but this time we uh did want to include it because it is it is a very important part of the story, For sure. which we did, just didn't touch on before, and a very moving part of the story. Uh, and uh, we also knew that um, the whole business these days of, of people telling the story rather than a narrator 
is more powerful, especially the kind of people that were with Ed who are he, – he loved their company because they were such good mm. sort of humorous and funny people or good storytellers. So we knew he had a huge resource there to, to humanise the story uh, to, and also for them to talk not just about the expedition but about Ed Hillary himself. And you can see that with some of the protagonists. You, excuse me, mm. I don't, know, yeah. don't know all the names, but you know, yeah. there was tears shed on the film yes. when yeah. one of the gentlemen was talking about yes. his love for Ed. Yes, yeah, yeah. So that that's why it's, uh, I guess it's it's no longer I, in my eyes a documentary. It's more than that. It's it's a whole you know, and it's a sense just bring, in a sense trying to bring Ed Hillary back to life mm. and for people to actually feel that they travelled with him and, and got to know him. Yeah, it, it was a really um, what is the word I'm looking for? Personal, interpersonal. You felt very close. You felt a part of it. Yeah. And like I mean, you know, there's there's Kiwiisms. The Hamilton Jets, one of them, and mm. so Ed's one of these iconic things mm. in New Zealand mm. and to see the two of them together mm. on this magnificent river mm. was just um yeah it was a really good watch it's a great watch thank you there's another review for you a great watch <laughs> Pat Britton did five star um but no it was great I wonder as well because you know you always do in in filmmaking there'll still be stuff left on the cutting room floor I mean, there'll still be some things you haven't included that, I don't know, maybe you would have if you wanted to give yourself another 20 minutes. What have we missed? Is there, is there like, if you're going to do a third iteration of this in another 10 years' time, what have we missed from this one? To be honest, I'm not too sure if I can't, I don't think there is. I think we we, we, we made it, we made it a normal cinema length, so we kind of double the length of the original documentary. Mm-hmm. And I can't think of anything that we really have, uh, I, I missed. I, I think it's, I think it's a good, a good blend of, the, the, the highlights of the expedition there were lots of them because we had tigers tiger sightings at one end of the journey we had yeah. the whole of India then the rapids and then then the the, the climb past all the Hindu shrines and the climb at the end when was the last was this the last time he went up Everest in a, in a climbing capacity oh, it wasn't Everest it was just another a mountain near uh in the, another part, end right. of the Himalayan chain, right? Part of the Sorry, Himalayan so the chain. Himalayas, yeah, that's yeah. Right. I put the two and two yeah. together. Yeah, but it, no, seriously, it was it was his last climb. He uh, he didn't ever go as high again. He that, he that did, makes it even weirder that it wasn't included in the original documentary. I mean, that means this is a historic moment. Oh, they're, they're one of the greatest New Zealanders ever. Mm. What he's known for, it's like you wouldn't would you would you not broadcast Richie McCaw's last All Blacks game? You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. No, he we and the original film did did see us going going to the summit, but what it didn't say didn't have it didn't have the story of wh- what happened to Ed on the way, um, because it was just uh, but. Yeah, but it was his last climb. He he kept he kept working for two more decades with the Sherpas mm-hmm. and still on lower hills, just struggling up the hills, still doing this work for the Sherpas. Even when at the age of about eighty, I was still filming him up there. Um, so was this a, was this the beginning of a lifelong relationship between you and Ian? Yeah, it was because I I was only well, I'd only heard about this expedition three months before it happened, and and I only made and I only made one film, so I was very. I thought I'd write to him in case <laughs> he gave me, but I didn't have much to put on my CV except I had spent a bit of time in India, made one film, uh, but I did get the job and luckily I didn't mess it up and uh, and he gave me the chance to do six more films with him. Wow! Over the years. So, so what else yeah. did you do with Ed? What was other than this documentary? Mm. What else was your relationship with him? Well, when he he wanted. The, his work with the Sherpas. We did a, a, a three films actually. One was a National Geographic film, and two others, all set in the Everest region. Okay. Um, various. We did look various adventures in the Everest region, but always incorporating some school building and things like that because he was still actively doing that. Then he became. Um, oh, another thing he wanted to do was he was based in the Second World War in Fiji. And every weekend he see him. He saw a mountain uh, like a volcanic spire, and, mm. he, and every weekend he'd go out with his mates with it, using a clothesline <laughs> to try and climb this thing. And and uh, so he'd always wanted to do it. So we made a film of, of him doing uh, doing that climb at the age of sixty something, and uh, then we did a journey right through Fiji and ending up underwater, which he'd never done before. And then we did another one in, in India when he was high commissioner. We did. We started at the very bottom of India, and uh, climbed by various means, transports, of camels, and elephants, and things like that, and ended up in the Himalayas. <laughs> so it was another kind of Indian journey from the ocean. But so so that um, 
yeah, I ended up doing six films all together with him. Wow. It's interesting you would say uh, about The Underwater, he'd never done before. There's mm. something about him that always makes me think he's looking for the next record to break, big thing to do, you know, uh, mm. and I thought... I wonder how deep he ever went. <laughs> you know, he's been to the highest of the highs. Yeah. You know, maybe one of the things he wanted to do was to go to the, the depths of the ocean or something to say he's been everywhere. Well, he, he went down a certain, you know, <laughs> not, not, he didn't break any sort of depth record, <laughs> yeah. but he, he, there he was scuba diving. So, yeah, it's an unusual sight to see him, but literally scuba diving. He did go to the North Pole and the, and the South Pole, of course, as well. So he went to most of the, you know, he, we don't seem to have people like this anymore. I mean, I'm sure mm. on some level, on some place, you know, the, the great Kiwi OE is still happening. I remember stories of my cousins going, you know, and, and doing their adventures where they have literally just a, a small bag with one change of clothes. And I've got a cousin who's a very good kayaker and kayaking all over the world. But he, Ed, seems to be on another level, which seems to be sort of a gentleman of yesteryear. Hmm. They don't seem to be around quite so much. These, you know, is it, I always forget his name, Ralph, not Renu Fine, oh, or yes, yeah. whatever his name is, the guy who's lost all his fingers That's who's right. in the Arctic. Yeah. He's he's in his 70s or 80s. Hmm. They, they, we don't seem to have these same adventurers in this day and age. Well, I think, yeah, it, it's hard to be first these days. It's hard to think of things, but, but still, I think there are a lot of. It's a Do you think that's a driving force? That's why oh, it was, because I, they had I, the opportunity. Yeah, no, I, I think that he, uh, he, he, Edmund Hillary loved mountaineering, and any, any chance to get on any big mountain was, was good. Yeah. And it, it just so happened that Everest was there, and he was offered the chance to be on that. And of course, uh, he had a huge motivation. He really wanted to be the one to. He and George Lowe, his other the other New Zealander on it, mm. they really wanted to be the ones to, to, to get to the summit first. But I guess there are still a lot of people out there who are doing doing things, but they I guess because they it's not the first or they it's hard to get any sort of publicity these days. Have you been up Everest yourself? I've I've filmed three times on Everest, but I've never been to the summit. Okay. Is that something that you would like to have done? I think so, yeah. As as a um I would love to have got the perfect uh, summer, summer shot, uh, taken my camera there and, uh, and and shown people what it's like to do those last uh, 20 steps to the summit. And what about, Jace, could you Google up um, something like Q to the summit of Everest and you see pictures this day and age of mm. like 100 people in a queue. Mm. Maybe it's not 100, maybe it's 50 yeah. people. Oh, it's, no, it's a recent thing of no, people, make, uh, people dying in the queue. Yeah, Make, make it 200. It. Oh, there's, there's, it's, what happened, of course, the famous picture happened earlier this year when, I don't know, we could at least, at least 200 people. It just, normally normally with Everest, you get a few win, win, windows of weather to, to get to the summit. Yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> that was good. Well, well, what was that headline? Eleven dead on Mount Everest in one of the worst seasons on record. That's uh, this year. Yeah, because people, yeah, that's because so I read saw this the other day. People are, are um, yeah. so dudes are, are waiting, are, yeah, like and this. dying because dudes, of the weather. Dudes mm, yeah. at the bottom, yeah. So they're spending longer than they should be because they're having to stay still because of the people in front of them. That's right. Yes, it's uh, this. Well, there we go. That's that's that, a classic see, that's photograph. That's ridiculous. That's the summit's just up near the top there, and all those people are at, at extreme height, breathing oxygen, and and. If they're there too long, the oxygen will run out. Or well, and so there's also there's also the the, the death zone up there mm. that you get above a certain height. That was and a, that was above it. Yeah, yeah and your yeah. body starts eating itself. Yeah. So it seems to be well. I mean, see the numbers are going up. I guess that's because also there are more people. Mm. I mean, very few people would have died prior to fifty three because <laughs> maybe no one's been right at the top. Um, yeah. But you know, but but post fifty three, as it's become a commercial tour, um, a commercial operation. Yeah. It just that um, the the weather forecasting is so good these days that people know when the little windows. They need about three a three day window to mm. get from base camp up and back safely. Right. And it so happened that this year there was only about one good window, and everybody knew <laughs> that, that they had to be. So that that explains that photo especially that that was the day that was best to climb Everest, and the whole six hundred of people that were trying that year. All, virtually most, not all of them, but most of them tried on that day. So, and and by trying, I mean you you you're attached to a fixed line. They take a 
uh, there's a rope basically from base camp to the summit of Everest mm. in, in little stages, not but you can and you have to just you're staying on that rope and it's very hard to get past the person in front of you. And and is it one rope? So what about coming up and coming down? Well, no, it's only it's only one rope as far as I know. So therefore, if there's yeah, 600 I think people, in some there's places, 600 up and then 600 down. Yeah, I think in some places there are two ropes, but the, uh, up there where we just but it was only one rope, so yeah. it's very hard. People coming down are trying to get past all the people coming up. And uh, but as the main thing, if you're up there too long, you only have a finite supply of oxygen, and then you're stuck in a situation where you you you're not you you run out of oxygen, and it's much more dangerous. I must um, I've always thought about people filming. I think that I'm IMAX filmed that terrible climbing mm. tragedy. It was in the mid to late nineties. Yes, yeah. And I remember some facts and figures about. You know, people who break a toothbrush in half mm. to make their load lighter going up Everest. Yes, there yeah. was these dudes carrying, mm. you know, thirty kilo cameras. Yeah, sort of thing. What's it like to be a filmmaker in that sort? And not that you've been to the, the summit, yeah. but certainly in low oxygen areas. Yeah, lugging around all this big um, film equipment. It is pretty hard. It, it, it's um, with the IMAX camera, I think they had f- five, four Sherpas or five Sherpas carrying it in bits, and they assembled it on the summit. But even the cameras I've been using, and I've been pretty high on Everest, mm. and, and um, it, it is it is harder, and especially hard. One of the key elements of taking good video or anything is to to to, to hold your breath, <laughs> so right. you know, the shot <laughs> becomes still, you know, it's, it's fairly fairly steady. But so it's much harder to hold your breath up there because mm. often you're not using oxygen. Most people only use oxygen during the the top top part of the ascent. Uh, but often to lower down you're not but it's you get very breathless very easily especially yeah. if you're you know trying to use a camera so, yeah that was the yeah. that was the I, I forget the gentleman's name it's embarrassing i've forgotten his name but the famous story about the kiwi who made the phone call from on Everest. yes yeah terrible yeah. i look at that that 600 people whatever it was at Q, mm. and i just go why it seems that perhaps We've lost the Ed Hillary's of the world, the people who actually cut a path. Mm. And you know, there's that saying is if I see further, it's only because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm. It's like everyone's trying to stand on his kind of shoulders now. Mm. and uh, But they're not just standing on their shoulders. They're standing on their shoulders in their padded shoes with uh, comfortable jackets <laughs> being held up by another group that's actually the ones kind of pushing them to the, to the mm. top. So mm. it's almost like, respectfully to people who have climbed Everest, I never have, never will, have mm. no intention, don't, not interested. Mm. Um, kind of, kind of, they're kind of pseudo-eds. They're sort of, I don't know, It's it sort of feels like, I hear people using the phrase nerfing the world, we're nerfing the world. You know, you're mm. wrapping everything in mm. spongy stuff so uh, it doesn't hurt anymore. Mm. And although obviously climbing to the top of Everest is a huge achievement, no question about that, mm. there feels like there's an element of nerfing the world because compared to what it was compared to what it was oh, sure, it's so yeah. easy now it's not yeah. easy but compared to what it was yeah that's, that, that's it's, true it's not the same um no it's not the same insurmountable yeah effort was well, even from a talking from a you know carrying cameras up you know everest you know mm-hmm. these days you can go to harvey norman and buy an, a sony a7r2 and shoot 4k and it's it's it fits in the size of your hand you know it weighs two and a half you know mm. well the, yeah the, exactly the cameras we film on the yes. rx 100 yeah. four, um, fours you know you can it weighs about 700 grams and it shoots 4k video yeah and stick that in your back pocket climb the mountain get some shots that will be that mm. that would rival 16 millimeter film if shot correctly oh sure you know? yeah um yeah. and away you go yeah mm. yeah so everything's easier mm. So what else? What's your life at the moment? You have, you have this is this is your today job, kind yeah. of getting the the word out about the stocko. But what else mm. is Michael Dillon all about? Well, I've been uh, I've been a freelance cinematographer all my life, mm-hmm. and uh, so and also occasionally a producer. So I so I'm always thinking up ideas, and uh, so I've. But this year's been very much about this film because it's been such my biggest project ever. But I've got lots of lots of other ideas that, that um, involve, well, for instance, I, I film somebody climbing Everest from sea level and uh, I, I talked to him into it because, I, as I said, as you said, a lot of people have climbed Everest. I've mm. been to the summit, mm. and, but no one had ever climbed the whole whole mountain. Like It's measured from sea level. so Because they normally kind of fly to Kathmandu. Yeah, they, well, they fly so to So how Kathmandu. high is Kathmandu? They fly to, well, they actually fly to Kathmandu. Then most of them fly on to um, Lukla, which is a... 
airstrip Hillary built at about to, in, in uh, three three thousand meters, and so in a so sense, three thousand meters above uh, above sea level. Right. Yeah, so. Oh, that's an interesting. That, that, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, after all, Everest is measured from sea level, and yeah. if people claim to have climbed Everest. Well, you could say that they've only climbed the top half. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I talked to I talked to climber a climber into doing the whole thing. Yeah. And we actually started on the very same beach that um, we started this ocean to sky jet boat expedition oh, cool. from. And he walked all the way and and got and actually it was twenty years ago, so he, there was no queue, no 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 um, rope even, and he he got to the summit. So I've always thought that it would be nice to film other other mountains in the world being climbed from sea level. Yeah, that's um, really interesting because mm. isn't there like seven major summits around the world? Yeah, am I right in thinking that people talk about I've done the seven major summits? Yeah, they, or is that one on each continent? There's one on each continent. Yeah, okay. that, that's that's the that's the next challenge people have to not just climb Everest but to climb you know Kilimanjaro mm. and one South America and the the the, the 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 seven and that's one one challenge and, and I guess that distinguishes somebody from just want, who wants to climb Everest from somebody who really likes to challenge themselves. Is that, I, is that we're looking at the seven Jace? What are we doing? Yeah, that, there's some the one in Ant, there's one in Antarctica. Then there's yes. a, the yes. highest mountain in Europe, which is actually not Mont Blanc; it's in, in Russia, right? In the eastern part, of the western part of Russia. Mount and Kilimanjaro. then there's Kilimanjaro and uh, Aconcagua in South America. So did you actually? You said you filmed that one. Or was it just an idea? Um, the, the, no, the I, I filmed. I filmed um, Tim McCartney Snape the climber climbing Everest. Yeah, and but my idea is to 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 climb for somebody not not necessarily a mountaineer to take the challenge for instance of climbing um kilimanjaro from sea level mm. and you can see all of africa and maybe get eat, eaten or bitten by an animal or so you when, and when you say sea level you literally mean starting at starting the water. at starting at the water not just get, not somewhere on the continent that's at zero no it starts uh, just starting in the surf like we did on when we did climbing everest from sea level we actually started in the in the surf and, and, and walk, walk to shore and, and walk for another thousand kilometers and ended up on the summit of Everest. So you, I'm always thinking of maybe I'll, I will, will never do these ideas of my own, but I, I'm always thinking of ideas for future projects. Do you have, um, like you, your company is what, Michael Dillon Films? Yes. Do you have a group of you know people coming along underneath you that you're farming these ideas out to? <laughs> no. You, you're the <laughs> producer and you go, now go do the lead work. <laughs> but I, I, I will, I mean, I'm going to put all these ideas down on paper and somebody hopefully will do it one day. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. What's the What's the one documentary that you've always wanted to make that hasn't quite come together yet? I guess it's probably, probably something like that. It's yeah. Just a... Uh, yeah, more more interesting tra- travel documentaries of, or, or challenges, mm-hmm. like I've just mentioned. Mm-hmm. So the travel documentary thing is that something you've done as well? Like that's a bit different from mm. a this. This feels like an expedition documentary. Yeah. That's a bit different from a travel documentary. <laughs> what have you done in that world? Well, well, the most interesting one probably is that uh, we took a London taxi from Buckingham Palace to the uh, Sydney Opera House. In the, we 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 set the meter going in um, outside Buckingham Palace. And we basically drove the taxi all the way. Oh, not all the way, of course. There's a bit yeah, of sea between. Yeah, there's a bit of water in between. But we, but we, we drove it from 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 uh, England or from Paris, say, or France, all the way to Bombay. Is okay. one part. Then yep. we flew it to to, the, to uh, Bangkok and went down the peninsula. Then we flew it to the other side of Australia, the western side, and all the way across Australia, and. Uh, the meter, it, the meter was running the whole time. And how much? How much was it costing? Uh, Thirty-five thousand pounds. Wow, pounds! <laughs> what year was this? This is 1988. Oh, okay, fair, so fair thirty-five thousand pounds there is more like seventy thousand pounds. Oh, today, definitely, yeah. Which is more like one hundred fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> That's an expensive trip. It was an expensive trip, <laughs> but but yeah, that was just a, an idea that somebody had thought of, and uh, it, it made a good doc- documentary. Yeah. So is that how your mind works? The creative side. You go, yeah, you I do. like that idea. Well, what can I do with it? You, you do because um, you, as I said, f- with Everest. Okay, there have been millions of Everest documentaries. Mm. So uh, therefore, I had I had thought the idea of climbing it from sea level was an interesting one, and it proved to be. Uh, so yeah, you're always thinking of ideas um, to to um, do something differently, or someone had never thought somebody had never thought of. Mm. What do we, um, we, we learn more about Ed in this doco, mm. 
but someone who obviously had a lifelong relationship with him was only mm. a good portion of your life. Mm. What are some of the things that we don't know about him in the public? Yeah, that you know of him from a personal um, relationship. I, I know for a start that he he's an extremely good organizer. He was he was um, even from school days. He he was. A, very academically gifted. He he was um, way ahead of everybody else, but and he and he went to university for a year. But he kind of didn't like it. He didn't probably didn't like it. The fact that it had a roof on it or something. He <laughs> he, he preferred the outdoor life. Yeah. But you could see in the way he planned things. He 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 was extremely thorough in all his planning, um, and uh, so that's one side. And, and the humility side, we all know about that. Uh, that he never considered himself to be, um, you know. Uh, a great man and it was other people who thought that and um, I spent a fair bit of time with him especially in the Everest region where mm. there's a lot of trekkers around and they um, would go come into the tea shops when he's sitting there t- b- boasting about little things they'd done you know little small c- mountains they climbed and he, he just sat sit there saying nothing <laughs> and then there was one time when we were he was climbing a little hill with his son Peter and he was using an ice axe just just as a kind of walking pole mm-hmm. um, and we got to the top of the hill and he and Peter sat down on a rock and Ed was just holding his ice axe out in front of him just as sort of leaning on it a bit and an American trekker came by and just sort of didn't know who he was and, and said hey bud that's not the proper way to hold an ice axe <laughs> and, uh, and 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 of course the the thing about ed is he didn't say oh don't you know who i am yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he didn't he didn't say anything he just let the this american trekker instruct him on how to hold an ice axe properly oh, really? <laughs> and then and the guy walked off and and was never never <laughs> didn't know who he was he had instructed it's such a i mean not to embarrass the American tourist, but it would be mm. lovely for him to know <laughs> who that <laughs> person was. Yeah. Because oh, to it, was be able it was so inconsequential of oh an no. interaction, he wouldn't remember the interaction. But if yeah. he'd been called out, he would yeah. actually, it, well, it would actually, actually be a nice life. Yeah. I almost did because we were busy filming. I was busy filming him at the time, but I would, love, would have loved to run off him and told him, you know, you know who you just instructed to hold an ice axe. <laughs> but, he'd, but he'd played the game. He said, oh, thank you. This is oh, Yes, he did. Like, he allowed him to yeah, show Yeah, but that's the, way, that's the way he was. He was... Uh, he didn't have the great man syndrome that you know mm. that some people do have, mm. and that was I think that's something that we all know of him. Mm. The thing is that you've experienced, yeah, with yeah. him. Mm. Did you? Um, were you? So you knew him prior to his second marriage, obviously, because it was only a couple of years after his first wife passed. Yes, yes. So did you know him? Were you close enough to him that you were involved with? Like, were you at the wedding for the I was, for yeah. stuff? Yeah, yeah. So you were really you were on the inside. That's cool. Yeah, I was like it because I. Uh, um, Always as a young, you know, as a, as a boy, I guess everybody my age, Ed was a hero, and mm. I used to, I used to um, read all those books about Ed uh, taking his children up the uh, to the Everest region. I kind of wished I was one of his children. So, so I, I was lucky in that um, I just managed because when I heard about him doing up the Ganges, and I would had a bit of filmmaking experience, mm-hmm. I, I definitely that's the way I. That's why I wrote to him and hoping, and so I kind of ended up in the Hillary family in a sense. That, uh, and so for the last twenty-five years of his life, I, I, I was called joined those other people who. Uh, and was it the kind of relationship that you'd have a, a beer on a Saturday afternoon, <laughs> like like without a camera, or was it always like Sometime. a work a work relationship? No, no, it was because we, we as I said, we we um, I did did all the second his was the second marriage the wedding. I, I went was invited not to film it. I just as a guest, mm. and uh, and uh, it was very special. And I went to his funeral, which was um, mm. a very special occasion because I don't know what you know the story that um, just just before. Uh, the the night before the funeral, they now and people were he was in state lying in state for a few days, um, and it was announced that the, the cathedral where he's in would be would remain open for the whole um, uh, night, and uh, so I went up at about midnight because uh, you know he meant a lot to me and was a last chance kind of to get mm. get close to him physically, and um, I was just amazed at what I saw because the the queue at midnight went out of the door of the cathedral and way down the street about mm. a, it was just proved how how much that everybody who, knowing that they, this was their very last chance mm. to to pay tribute to him 
kind of all left their lounge rooms at once. And, and uh, <laughs> we ne- I never saw the end of that queue. It must have been at least a kilometre long, and this is midnight. Wow. And uh, so I walked down the queue. And I guess this is the reason, w- one of the key reasons I remember why I decided to make this new film, uh, because halfway down, the, or half a kilometre down the queue, there was an Indian family, a big Indian family, uh, a little boy holding a flower. Mm-hmm. And I knew that they wouldn't get passed by it uh, until about two o'clock in the morning so I sat I chatted with him and kind of told them about the fact that his he loved India his best expedition was their journey up the the Ganges and and then I kind of realized that okay I was on it I filmed it I could I could actually show that family that they can actually with these modern techniques of you know uh, making film look like it was shot yesterday mm. and with it the um, people on the trip myself included telling the story I could kind of bring Edmund Hillary to life to that family who were there at midnight who'd never met him uh, but but wanted to obviously and it meant a lot to them so I kind of if I trace back why I wanted to make this new film it was due to that probably that incident then that I, I knew that this is a we wanted to, we could, we could bring Edmund Hillary back to life um, through through people in a sense uh, being able to uh, share that expedition with him. I'm just um, I'm caught in a moment thinking about we sort of went oh going up the Ganges and you know tens of thousands of people coming out to watch Ed Hurley they really thought a lot of them in, mm. in India but that's what you're describing they did here in New Zealand. Well, that that surprised me to see yeah. that I'm obviously this. It was the fact that every everybody and all cultures within New Zealand um, have a huge amount of respect for him. As I said, some would even come out <laughs> to, you know, to at two o'clock and all through that night mm. uh, to to pay that last personal respects to him, and and uh, so. Yeah, it, it's it, it's um and and, the, and therefore in India and and or and on the journey up the Ganges, it surprised us that so many Indians would uh, feel so strongly that they wanted to be in his presence or to see him pass by, which is what happened at his funeral. It, and, exactly, and, and I don't yeah. know how many people yeah. went through the mm. through the the queue to see him. Yeah, but I mean, it include mm. because they televised it. I'm pretty sure, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Pretty sure they did. I remember they watching did. it. Yeah, that. You know, ten thousand people showed up in parts of India, but mm. you know, we did it here because yes. obviously not to the same little G God. We considered him a god, yeah. little G. Mm. Um, and and we actually, it's it's the same in life in India. Mm. How he was worshipped mm. is very similar to in death in New Zealand. How he was worshipped, yes. quote unquote. Yeah, yeah. So that's the actual. Is that an actual photo there, Jace? That is. Yes. Yes. That's yeah. the funeral. Um, mm. Was it Parnell Cathedral? Is yeah. that what it is? Yeah, yeah. The, it's the, the main cathedral in Holy Trinity Cathedral in Auckland. Was he someone who was interested in things like how the world was running, politics, that kind of thing as well? Is I mean, I'm sure he was obviously interested in environmentalism yeah. and looking after people. Was mm. he someone who was interested in, you know, leaders of countries, that sort of thing as well? Yeah, and he, he was. And, and uh, he... It's, it, he did, he was a very successful Indian High Commissioner because mm-hmm. he oh, didn't say that soon after this this journey up the Ganges, um, David Longy appointed him New Zealand High Commissioner to India. So that's late seventies. Yeah, late. It was about the eighties. Yeah, yeah right. the eighties. Yeah. So he he had and he's a very he's a I said he's a very intelligent man. So mm-hmm. he he was uh, it wasn't just a figure. It was a, a, a sort of it was a. He was um, not just somebody that people would love to. Even the Prime Minister of India would love to be in their company. But he mm. was, he was uh, administratively a very good uh, operator as well. Yeah, so. amazing man. Yeah, an amazing documentary as well. Thank you very much. Why don't you? Um, maybe this is a bit a bit of a harsh thing to ask, but you mm. know they talk about an elevator pitch. Like you're talking about business. Give me an elevator pitch, meaning if you walk into an elevator before we get to the ground floor, you got to sell me the idea for your business. If you had an elevator pitch, like a, a minute to describe the film for people who are listening and watching to mm. get out and see it, give it a, give it to us in a nutshell. Well, superficially, it's a journey. It's it was his greatest journey. So, in, in terms of an adventure documentary, it's got all the elements totally. of it. But it's it's um 
it, it stars all the people that Ed loved to be with. So there's a lot of humour, yep. a lot of drama, and then and and, uh, and also the fact that all the way along we're in the presence of Ed Hillary, mm-hmm. we're sharing this this his favourite expedition, and when we kind of grow to love him towards the end, and then he almost dies, mm. and has to be it's a very dramatic ending to this film. So I'm not sure if I've got a minute left, <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I, I would. Uh, people, so that, people are very moved by it. So that's one of the things that you've just said, which echoes watching it. It's him and his mates playing on some level, hmm. out for a play, hmm. big adventure going yeah. on, but with his with his friends hmm. and his new friends because the guys who invented the Hamilton jet are on this yes, journey as well. That's right. Yeah, which um, which was amazing, hmm. and yeah, I love it. It's a, it was a great great watch, and. Um, Yeah, thanks for coming in. Thank you, Pat.